Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, today. Um, thank you at Thomas and Stacy uh, for inviting me. Um, do you hear me well? Is it good? Yeah. Okay. And thank you also for the captioning and the hosting uh, here in Todbot. Uh, I am really, really um, pleased to be here uh, today because um, that's my first time in New York, Thomas said, but it's also the uh, one year ago, I arrived in Montreal from France uh, to develop Tactile Studio in North America. And so it's one year day per day I was landing uh, in the airport in Montreal. So I'm very, very happy to be here to be able to share with you um, the incredible accessibility that we are doing and uh, maybe to have some new ideas together. Um, today, I would like to speak about um, accessibility in a museum in the cultural content context. Um, how can we use the accessibility to increase um, the experience of the visitors with, uh, of course, disability, but also for all, all of the visitors of the museum to give them a better than understanding and a better experience uh, of the art, the science, the architecture, uh, different kind of um, thematic. And uh, we are very strongly inspired by universal design. Um, and we think about um, the users in a user-centered uh, design um, orientation. Um, as you heard, I am French native speaker, so if you don't understand or if something is not clear, just please ask me to repeat and to uh, try to make it clearer. Um, I will do my best and we are in a, an accessibility topic, so that's the minimum I can do, of course. Um, so when we think about accessibility, mostly in museum, we think about um, the facility for people in wheelchair, for the mobility uh, issues. But what I want to uh, share with you today is more the next level of the accessibility, how we can give access to the content, to the message and the intention of the museum. So um, um, we have a... Um, a few time to do that, uh, like uh, I think 45 minutes and a few questions um, after that. If you have some questions during uh, my presentation, just raise your hand and uh, share it with us. And after uh, the presentation, you can. I also bring some samples and different examples of what we can do and I will be uh, happy to share it with you. So um, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I used to work in a cultural field for 10 years uh, in France first. Um, I was accessibility manager in the Mankin Museum in Paris, uh, which is a museum about um, human beings in the cultural and biological aspects. And I was there in charge there uh, of the accessibility for the renovation project and uh, for during two and a half years, and after that uh, for programs during two and a half years. So it was a very great chance to have the possibility to see if what we thought was really um, useful and to adjust the, uh, what was necessary. And um, before that, my first meeting with uh, accessibility was in my first job uh, when I was in the natural, National Natural History Museum in Paris, uh, in charge of the permanent exhibition for, for children. And my boss told me 10 years ago, you're going to be in charge of the accessibility project. Said, Great, how do we do that? Um, I have no idea, so you just find the people and to, to do that. So we built a project with uh, users and with, that was also my first meeting with Tactile Studio. Tactile Studio at that time was a little company with four passionate and dedicated people, uh, a bit crazy too, uh, who start in the basement of a studio with a 3D machine, uh, laser cutting and printed. And uh, there were two people dedicated in uh, cultural mediation, uh, very uh, concerned by the artistic topic, and two people in the um, um, techniques. So they start with us this project, and nowadays, 10 years after, 
Uh, Tactile Studio is an international company. Uh, we drive more than 350 projects uh, in more than 10 countries, obviously more in Europe, uh, but we start in Canada this year. Um, and we opened uh, different offices, one in London, one in Berlin, and the last one in, um, in Montreal. So I am uh, driving this uh, since one year. Um, Sorry. No. So it has been a very big adventure. We we had the chance uh, really to work with a lot, big range of museum, uh, the Louvre uh, four times, but also the V&A in uh, in London. And each time it was meeting with incredible people, uh, very inspiring, and also other partners uh, working with the users um, to build um, the next level of accessibility, to try and to fail sometimes, and to try again, and to do better each time. Because accessibility is a long journey, and it never stops. So it's always um, about um, trying and developing new ID, new content, and uh, new solutions. Um, and those uh, museums start to make the difference. Okay, So I will I'll start today with um, maybe a quick introduction about um, the tactile specificity um, and the benefits and challenges of that for all the visitors. And I will focus on three case studies um, more deeply. Um, of course, accessibility is a very good way to let people be um, in contact with art, but it's also helping all the visitors to have a, a very new experience. When we saw, um, when, we, when we are seeing, we have an immediate perception of um, the environment and of an artwork. For instance, here we have the Joconde. Uh, so it's immediate, it's a center to, it's related to the environment, so we can have an idea of the size, we can have an idea of the material it's made uh, on. Uh, but when we uh, discover it from the touch, it's much more different. It's um, very sequential. Uh, it's not uh, the sea. And um, it's centered in the users um, for his person to have an idea of the dimension and uh, um, the relief, the information in the, in the position take time to build a mental image. So um, work in Tactile Studio is to tend to clarify to restore this uh, artwork uh, and they had the idea of doing it uh, in front of the visitors. So they put a, a window glass to protect of course the all the objects. Um, but at that time, they had the problem that people can see the worker walking, but not really have an idea of what it, they were walking on. So they put a picture in the window to show them what was the, the, the painting. And they asked Taxi Studio to develop um, a station with an interpretation of that uh, masterpiece. It's like four and a half meters per three meters, so it's a very huge painting. As you can see, there is, um, we can have a, an horizontal line, and in, in the top of the painting, there is no so many relevant information. It's like just the background. But on the bottom of the painting, there is a lot of uh, characters. Uh, Gustave Courbet is represented in the center of the painting uh, with his inspiration news uh, behind him. And on the right side, on the left side, he has different people on the right side. There are those who inspire him, uh, those who support him. And on the left side is more like his dark side. But so we, the curator wanted to focus on the composition of the, um, of the painting and of, on a few details. Here is the interpretation uh, in tactile, relief and contrast. Uh, we have black and white and gray um, 
to contrast the image. As you can see, there are different lines to uh, explain the composition and the construction of the, um, um, of the painting. But doing different texture, the, the, the black shape has been a bit like um, a board, if I can say that, to highlight different detail. So we can see on the, on the left side uh, where there are the dark side of uh, Gustave Courbet, different detail who are um, highlighting in that case. And uh, above, in the top of the, of the painting, there is a little round where Gustave Courbet represented uh, his mistress. So it's a little detail that in the real painting, we can't really see it, but uh, doing that work of clarifying and selecting different information that allows to highlight those little details. And as the topic was also to explain the restoration work, um, we offer the museum to develop also another station with different canvas that people can touch and understand that the work of um, Courbet was a very long process. He, he first put different layers on, in, on his canva. So that's also why this restoration took so much time because people need to be very cautious with the, with the work. And on the left side, we add some audio to explain uh, the work of the um, restoration. So at the end, in front of the, um, this big window where behind there were the restoration project, they had an explanation of uh, the artwork and uh, of, the, um, of the work of the museum. This project has been uh, traveling after that, once the, the, the painting was uh, again uh, hanged in the museum, and they sent it to different schools to make um, a connection and mediation around the, this project. Um, as I told uh, earlier, it's, uh, we cannot do things for visually impaired people without them. We, can do, we cannot think for the others. We need to share uh, with people to know what is better for them what, and to test the ergonomy of the station, um, to have uh, better feedbacks also of their needs. And doing that, um, we have um, defined uh, five pillars, I will explain later, but first I just want to introduce the way that someone will discover a station, tactile station. Uh, there is three levels of discovery. The first, of course, is you know, um, a big level. I mean, just discovering the size and what is in front of me, just like seeing what is it? And after that, going into the different uh, information block. Okay, where is the title? Where is the, is there uh, something to touch, a sculpture? Okay, where is the captions? And after that, people enter into the detail to start to build a representation, a mental representation. So uh, doing all that committee and all that work with um, users, we start to develop a texture vocabulary and uh, different resources to be able to um, give the better, um, the best uh, proposition for them. So here we have a picture of um, an exhibition in the south of France. It is uh, the Museum of Mediterranean Civilization. So for their permanent exhibition, uh, who deals with all the trades uh, on, the, on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, they wanted to have uh, interpretational panels. Um, what we did here is the interpretation of the painting on the side with the focus on the boat, because it was, of course, uh, about the, uh, all the trade who was made by, by boats. Um, I told you about the ergonomy of the, of the, of the panel. The, those needs to be uh, a bit inclined, like 20 degrees, to uh, give a better um, comfort to discover the, the, tack, the panel, but also the size. Uh, it's important not to oversize the, uh, the object. Sometimes we, we have huge and very nice ID, but it needs to be something that people can handle because you, you keep the connection when you have the both hands in the panel. It's also important to have the hierarchy of information to give the title and 
if possible, when you develop a different station in the same space to have a voc constant voc vocabulary with the same um, the title in the same space. Here you can see that there are two um, uh, two parts of the panel. On the right side, it's a high relief representation, and on the left side, there are the title. There is the title in the top, the text, black text, and the braille that we cannot really see because it's transparent. And um, on the bottom of the panel, there is the, the representation of the sheep, but also um, comparison with a car. It's not really um, uh, easy to see, but just to give an idea of the size, uh, of course, of the vessel. Um, we also add uh, the number for the audio description because in that museum they give some uh, audio guide that people can have and uh, so they can also have a description of the, um, of the panel and a QR code. So for the one who doesn't want the, um, uh, the audio description, QR code is it right? Uh, and there is a little sign for the children um, uh, game around the, the museum so they, they have a stop here. So the scale the, and the texture. Here you have another example. It's still in the same exhibition as you, uh, there, there are um, current uh, graphism, um, graphic design. And uh, we add here uh, some smell. So, because the merchant, they sell uh, spices and they sell here cloves. So, I was very surprised when I discovered that cloves grow on trees. I thought that was little uh, tree, but actually it's big tree. As you can see, the, there is a, a scale, uh, of a human scale on the, on the side. So, adding not only tactile, but also going to other senses with audio, with a smell, really helped visitors to enjoy their journey into the museum. So we spoke about the interpretation uh, of the panel and if we go more deeply into uh, the pedagogical approach, how we can give access to an artwork. Here we are with the Abu Dhabi Louvre um, who opened recently and who wanted to be a universal museum. So they wanted to develop a multi-sensory path there uh, to interpret that, their collection. If it, it's the portrait of George Washington. Um, the composition of the panel is in three parts. On the right side, because uh, we read from the right to the left uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, so there is the text. After that, in the center, there is the main object uh, represented. Here it's a painting with above the real material of the painting. Here it's a canva and a scale. And on the left side, they highlight different parts um, of the um, painting. The topic here to, was focusing on the symbol of power. In that painting, Washington is represented, uh, is seated uh, in front of um, the visitors, and he, uh, he has his hand uh, on, um, on documents. He, there is a curtain behind him, and he's wearing um, uh, a, sword. A, sword. A, sword. a sword. Sorry. <laughs> so doing that, it's really easy for us to check what are the main uh, objects and what are the main points of this symbol of power. And when we go back to the reading of the, um, of the painting, it's much easier to understand, okay, and if I go to another painting with the same kind of thing, I will be able to say, oh yeah, you know that the curtain is the symbol of power. So <laughs> it's really interesting um, to have this kind of um, um, decomposition of the project. Uh, another example here with the um, interpretation of a curved mirror in ivory. Uh, so we have the ivory uh, on the bottom and the representation in low relief of this, um, of this mirror, it's the back of the mirror, which is very tiny cur uh, curved, sorry. Um, and they wanted to highlight the importance of the animals in that uh, representation. Uh, so there is a 
parrot on the top. There is um, a horse with um, someone on it. And there are uh, a dog um, running after a rabbit. So when we go back to the main picture, it's much easier to understand and to disconnect was it's only representation uh, of flowers and curves and what is uh, actually the main uh, representation. So doing tactile object is also helping uh, to touch the collection directly to have a, a connection with the, the art. So it's really important. There is a challenge into offering a real tactile experience, not like a plastic or a toy. People want to touch and to have a, a real um, feedback of the what they touch so it's we always try to put uh, some density in uh, in those objects um, but it's also helping because most of the time museums say oh yeah we would like to do something to um, discover by senses but people cannot touch here of course we cannot touch in the museum so it's a way to offer this experience and still protecting the art collection there is another point here that also allows to restore um, the, the representation of objects who has been deter deteriorated through the time. Here we have uh, behind a window glass in the Louvre Museum uh, a helmet, the helmet of Charles uh, V, who has been uh, discovered into the ground not in very well um, state. So we, we did a 3D scan of uh, this object and we did a reproduction of it. And uh, so people can really have uh, the dimension of the, of the head of uh, the king and they also can understand the detail who are on the helmet. Um, there are least flowers who are symbol of um, of the king and different uh, inscription re written on it. So in this panel, there is also text, uh, braille, there is um, the, the vocabulary of the design of the exhibition is also respected with this um, little uh, metal, bar, uh, metal bar that we find into all the big window uh, of, the, um, of the museum because it's a very big challenge for lots of time because it's not so new to, to do things for um, tactile and um, solution for visually impaired people. But before they were put it into the corridor on the right after the exhibition and not inside the exhibition because there were um, design preoccupation, there were uh, aesthetic uh, to respect. And through that time, we didn't really um, uh, succeed um, to offer a very um, beautiful experience that can be in the exhibition. Nowadays, it's going to, with all the new technology, with all the new material, it's really much easier to do um, and to implement those uh, solutions. And that's a good point because, um, so we are here today for the Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, but it's um, it's in the law, it's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that people have the right to access, um, to access to the art. With the uh, 27 article of the declaration, it say everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural field um, and to enjoy the art. So here you have the Accessibility Disabled Act uh, who already um, push uh, this, uh, all this, uh, intention. In France, we have uh, a uh, law much later, who appear much later, in 2005. So that's very recent. And this law uh, obliged all the institution, the public institution, to be accessible until 2015. Guess what? It's not accessible already, but the move forward. So things have moved since then, and so that's a very good thing. And the International Council of Museums also recommend uh, to give an access to all the people, to their collection, to the heritage. So 
thinking of that, I think we are in a very good time to still um, develop those kind of solution. And if we uh, focus on the publics, on the visitors, a um, lot of people have disability, one, um, one to five people in the US and until 2030, people are going older and we have more seniors, more than 50% of the population going to be more than 65 uh, in a few years. So we speak about the silver economy too, and those people are grandparents. They go to museum with their grandchildren, they go with their friends, and they have, most of them, half of them have visually impaired issues. And there are also issues of mobilities. They have, uh, and we also have uh, museum fatigue. So if we bring all that together, if we don't think really about the disability of the people, but if we think about the ability of the institution to change the thing, to change the way that people can have an experience, they can have a seat on a sofa for a while, and after that going and smell something and have an experience, starting from their perception, starting from what they feel and not from what they know, from the knowledge they were supposed to have. So we can have a conversation from that. You feel that and I feel that, oh. And after that, we can go further and we can, we are just here to open windows. When people go to a museum, they pass one hour, two hour, maybe four for the patient 80. But in, into their life, it's not so much. So what we have to do is just to make the, exp the experience enjoyable, to let the people have the envy to go back and to bring their friend and, and and etc. So I am a bit lost in my notes. Um, yes, I, we, we saw that museums are changing. Uh, here it's uh, in the Belvedere in Vienna and they made an exhibition about Egon Schiele. The good point is that they wanted to design an um, um, interpretation of uh, the family, which is the a painting of the right of this picture. Uh, the wrong thing is that the, the furniture is not uh, really uh, wheelchair friendly. But as we say, it's always uh, a journey. It's always um, a work in progress. So there are a lot of constraints when we are working with museum because there are collection protection, there is um, climat climatization, and uh, there are space and all the rules to, uh, to, uh, um, to access. Uh, so, and there are a lot of teams. There are the communication, the collection, the education. So it's very difficult to make people speak together and have at the end a product and a project which is fully accessible. But doing that, the communication, the collection and the education have, be have been through the process. They maybe met some people with disability, discovered that they had needs and that they can, it was really easy to fit their needs. And so, it's a really, really wonderful journey, actually, to do that because uh, it's for people and it's doing with the people. Um, do you have some question before going through the case study? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jill. I'm from the Andrew High School Braille and Talking Book Library, and I'm loving this presentation. Thank you. We, um, we are doing a project called Dimensions, which is all about tactile art, and so I have some very specific questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, maybe I can focus on the, the corbet. And my question is about when you do make a tactile, have you decided to do um, the whole shape raised or the whole shape um, not <laughs> the opposite of raised or an outline or a double outline? Because we've been trying different things and trying to get some feedback and there's so many choices that are textured or not textured. And so what have you decided and how did you come to those decisions? Okay. Um, maybe to give a quick answer uh, of that, because I, I don't really know, but uh, what we can say first is that we mostly um, prefer the highlight than the curve. So that's like a general point, um, because it's much easier to understand when, when it, and the 3D, of course, it's the best way, but um, to have a high relief is much easier to have a representation that um, a curve. And to, uh, to, to ensure that the, what we have to 
raise and what we have not to raise. Uh, it's always about the intention. What is the topic? Is it about the trade into the Mediterranean Sea? So we're going to pick up the different examples who are focusing on that point. The, because there is always a subject who are fitting the intention and, and the message. So if it's an exhibition about painting and landscape uh, with a lot of different painting, maybe we are not going to raise the people represented in the painting, but more the landscape, just to give an idea, something like that. But I will be happy to, to share more later. If there is there was a question there? How do you decide um, what exhibits essentially to have smell associated with? Again, it's a question of intention and what fits the needs. And if you want, for instance, if we are in landscape, maybe some of the selected points are more relevant to have smell. If it's a, a spring field with a very lovely um, uh, flowers, or if it's a, uh, if there is a dirt and uh, garbage on the side. So, no, it's always interesting also to go and, um, and not only give good smell, but also to make a reaction, a reaction. Because when I smell something bad, I just say, hey, come on, just. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you invite someone else to discover what you have just smelled, but you don't tell him it's a bad smell, of course. So... Um, yeah, it's this kind of, uh, it's, it's always about the intention and what we want to say. What is the experience for someone who can see? Okay, what kind of experience I am going to offer for someone who cannot see? And try to make um, a scenario with that. And sorry, one more on that. How does that work? Is there a button or something? Or does it just smell constantly in there? Like how does, does it release smell? You mean the technique? Behind yes, that, or, yeah. like the tactile, uh, that yeah. depend. That depend. The one I show you was a very simple one with cloths uh, behind and just uh, open a uh, little um, uh, button who can open and close that people just have to push and, and pull. Uh, some other, it's with mechanic uh, pressure. So you press a button and there is a little uh, um, uh, fan who just gives the smell up. Uh, <laughs> um, that's yes. That can be different uh, kind of uh, technique. Yep. There is another question. Hi. Thank you. Uh, to your knowledge, is there a guide uh, for museum for museums on best practices for tactile accessibility? For tactile. There are good, very good guidelines uh, for the whole experience, like the Smithsonian guideline are very well known uh, here. And in each um, country, actually, in Canada, they also have a different guideline. Museums are trying to do the, their best, actually, to develop the accessibility. Uh, so they have guideline to help their designer because the, the, the first person who is concerned is also the one who's going to design the exhibition. Uh, but as a tactile experience, we have different um, uh, author who already uh, wrote on the topic. And uh, in France, we are very um, linked to uh, Brice, which uh, explain how we can, how a person very impaired can discover um, uh, a tactile uh, panel. But as really related to the topic of museum, uh, I don't know that. So maybe we, c we should do that. That's a great idea. Mm. Okay, maybe I, I just give you some other example to think more about. So that's an example I really uh, well know. No, no well, I really know well, because uh, it's the Mankind Museum. So this museum is located in Paris, in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, and it was a huge renovation project uh, during six years. We had, as I told before, this uh, law, 2005, um, who, and the, the museum were gonna open in 2015. So you can imagine that there were a lot of pressure. Uh, it had to be fully accessible. 
And the challenge was to give access to this very complex content uh, of the exhibition. The main exhibition is 2,500 meters square <laughs> with more than 2,000 uh, objects. And the um, exhibition is divided in three parts. Who are we as human beings? Where are we from? And where are we going? So saying that, go for a tactile experience. Um, I want to focus on the first part, wh who are we as human beings? Um, in the museum, they explain into um, different uh, composition, um, different topics. So we are uh, being of flesh and blood, we, have being, we are being of thought, of speech, of link, and we also had an history about the interest to the diversity, the, more like a history focus. So there were five topics in that uh, first part. All of the objects were behind windows. There were uh, the composition of each um, uh, big window were um, like a, a curiosity chambers you know, like an accumulation of a lot of objects and to uh, let people understand better the organization and the link between the object, there were um, a digital uh, explanation uh, in front of the little screen that people can interact with. So in those screen, there were uh, sign language interpretation and uh, captions. And the tactile experience uh, we imagine for that um, was related to the last part of, the, um, uh, of this first big part, who are we as human beings. The scenographic, the museographic display uh, had a very huge impact on the people who can see. It's like a big structure. Um, we can uh, imagine the, the form or the shape of the L, something like that, you know, from starting from the top of the um, gallery and going uh, on the right side. And on this structure, there were a lot of um, uh, faces represented, like mold, people who has been molded by uh, scientific during the 19th century. Uh, the scientists who were very interesting into the diversity of the population. Um, so that was a very aesthetic proposition for uh, the um, uh, designer. And we start thinking about what kind of experience we can, can we offer to visitors to explain them that we are people of flesh and, and blood, blood, sorry, blood, blood and flesh, uh, that we, are, uh, we have a cultural and a biological point of view because the, the exhibition put in front of um, some explanation about our biological origins and in the same time then cultural identity. For instance, um, they say that the main topic is like, we as human beings are all homo sapiens. We are the part of the same species, but in the same time, we are all very different and we have all different way to um, hold the, our culture, to wear, to um, represent our, our strengths and etc. So we decide, we, we think with the museum to design, to design a story, to design them different characters of a family who are gonna speak to the visitors. So different character of family, but a modern family. So there will be um, the mother, uh, about 48, coming from Senegal, arriving in France in her early 20. Her daughter, Marianne, which is 25. Um, and the, the mother met after that uh, a new husband who had already a child, uh, Mathieu, a little boy from 11 years old. And the grandfather of this boy is Lucien. He has 85 years old. He, 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 sorry. So we represented them as a sculpture people can touch. They had different audio, so in French, English, and Spanish. And on the side, there were uh, a focus on um, tactile graphics that people can discover. 
here with Marianne. She's introducing the exhibition. She welcomed the visitors and invite him to touch uh, her eyebrow and her ears, uh, explaining them that she has the heritage of that. So she introduced the notion of um, um, genetics and um, um, and biology. And after that, she also invited visitors to discover the tattoo she had on the shoulder to explain her that how, how each people try to be part of a community and to have his own relation with his, his body. The little boy, Matthew, uh, he's sp speaking about uh, speeches and languages. He's very fond of languages. He explained to visitors that uh, he loves and he starts to learn Greek. Um, and in that way, he transmits the, the explanation of the content in that part of the exhibition. So people can uh, have a relation with, the, um, with those uh, characters that can discover them uh, individually or in the doing each uh, station. Here we have Lucien. There is two pictures, one with uh, two seniors. Uh, we don't really know what they do. Maybe they're gonna touch the head of Lucien. And on the right side, there is a little boy which, uh, which is listening to, uh, to him. This kind of solution offer a different, uh, more emotional relation to the, um, uh, to the content. Lucien is a, has a finger missing because he, he used to work as a carpenter. And doing that, he explained that we use words to speak about wood. And depending on our environment, we are different vocabulary to tell things. And that's exactly what we say in a very huge um, windows and accumulation of objects. He said it in a totally different way. He also starts to speak about uh, brain damage and neuroplasticity, explaining that he has been injured during a war. So he loses a lot of his capacity, but he starts to recover by doing exercise. And so he explained that our brain has a very big plasticity and who help us to still learn things even at 85 years old. So here, here we are, the um, Fatou, the mother on the left side. And on the right side, there is a total sculpture. Yeah, because the, the character has only the top of, the, of their body. On the right side, there is uh, the last station people can um, meet uh, at the end of the, of the exhibition. Uh, it's uh, a woman which uh, is seated on who sat on a, on a little station. She is pregnant. She has a prosthesis on her knee. Um, and she's tired, of course. So she starts the conversation with visitors, uh, explain, explaining them that she saw it because she's tired after that exhibition. And she's also in front of uh, a big window with a lot of prosthesis and a lot of um, a mechanical solution to help uh, human to have better accessibility as you know the um, um, audio solution for people who are deaf until the last part of this um, uh, display are um, superhero so to give also in that display um, the idea of nowadays with the, te the technology we have a lot of solution to improve our life they also present some um, uh, aesthetic uh, chirurgy uh, solution. So we can uh, make solution to have um, better access and to, to live a better life, but until where? So she's wondering and she's thinking about all of that transhumanism um, evolution. Uh, and that's her who closed the, um, the exhibition. It's important also for us to have to let her have uh, to have the prosthesis because it's a way to integrate visitors who have issues, uh, mobility issues, to let them be part of the discussion. They are represented. If I am represented, I also feel part of the project. The second example, we go in a total different um, area, and we're going to speak about architecture with the Louis Vuitton Foundation. 
Um, they had a very beautiful art collection uh, to expose and uh, they wanted to build a new building uh, who has been built by Frank Gehry, an uh, Americano and Canadian architect. And he designed a huge building who looked like maybe a ship or a sailing boat or um, a cloud. We don't really know. There is, <laughs> maybe you have your own interpretation too, I don't know. <laughs> but there is like big veil, window veils uh, or shield who are hanging into the concrete structure. And uh, the foundation wanted to let people explore and discover uh, this architecture because when you are from the ground, you don't see at all the whole uh, composition. It's just like a huge building, very disconnected and, and, and very interesting, but very difficult to uh, handle. So what we offer them is to, re to give them a step-by-step -step explanation of that building because there are all those villes uh, represented and the concrete, meter, the concrete structure is more like an iceberg on what we put some uh, windows, shield, or and on the other, um, the, the last explanation is uh, only the floor levels explained. And there is an interesting story because they didn't have the permits to build three floors. So they play with the, um, the size of each floor of the roof. They go under uh, the ground to have a bigger um, space to host their collection. Here we have a close-up of the first uh, 3D model. So the windows will can be um, put off and on, so we can discover the inside. There are also the real material uh, on the right side explained, so the glass, the wood, and the concrete. The wood is for the big beams who hold the wheels. Here it's a close-up of the concrete structure, so you can uh, realize that there is no uh, right angles. All the, the walls are like wavy. They, are, they give an impression of maybe something organic too. And the last, um, the last example is only the floors. And there is an interesting point here that um, the foundation wanted to give that um, 3D models to let people have a better orientation into the museum. But when we start working with the foundation, with, with the Frank Gehry uh, team, the one who built uh, the, the building, they told us that that was the purpose, to make people to be lost into the museum. <laughs> So, so, some architecture uh, ideas, but uh, so the, the point here was not so really to, we could not do something that the, the building, the structure itself don't do, but we could explain people that that was normal to maybe be a bit uh, confused when you think you are on one level and you are in another one. So. And to explain also that there is um, water on the, on the ground, that, which is represented by the uh, texture here. And the last example with, with a Canadian one, because we are, um, so we start to work with Canada. We have already like eight projects, um, half finished and uh, half in progress. Um, what is interesting is that the Royal Ontario Museum um, wanted to make accessible an, a temporary exhibition uh, in Ontario, uh, the province in, in Canada, where is uh, the Royal Ontario Museum, which is in Toronto. They also have a law, uh, the AODA, so they, they totally copy the American. So it's the Accessibility Ontario Disabled Act. And they um, wanted so to make uh, their exhibition accessible, they had an exhibition about India uh, with different weapons. 
and they wanted to focus on the um, magnificent uh, representation of uh, animals into the weapons, into the uh, where we hold the weapon. So we offered them to describe six uh, weapons uh, in a tactile way with a, a, ta a braille explanation related to. What is also interesting is that in fine art museum, in a science museum, they're in fine art mostly, they start to offer new experiences, all, of course through tactile and uh, audio, but also through the experience of the visit. There were um, a swing, a very precious swing made by uh, uh, stones, I don't really know which kind of stone it was, but uh, of course there were a little barrier that people cannot go into that precious uh, swing, but they put a swing on the side to let people uh, have the feeling of the movement and just to enjoy for a moment uh, the, um, the exhibition around. So that's really interesting to see how a uh, little uh, solution can help the museum to give better experience. Um, in, that, um, in that image, there is a tactile panel explanation for a wedding procession. So they were uh, behind. There, there are a lot of huge objects represented uh, the different uh, traditional objects for a wedding. There are two elephants. We can see one. Um, and in the tactile interpretation, there is like the caption of each object. So the point here is also that those tactile devices can be used as the only device in the exhibition. It's not necessary to do it twice, like the one for the one who can see and the one for the one who cannot see. It's really useful to mix them and to have only one panel for everyone to just share the same experience. And to finish, I just to share with you uh, a bit of our preoccupation for the future. Uh, we are really um, committed to develop more digital solutions integrated into a tactile device because it's uh, nowadays people are all connected, more and more at least. Um, and we would like also to develop research projects uh, to be able maybe as uh, the uh, as you say before to maybe develop guidelines and uh, a recommendation uh, to go further and to go uh, through this, uh, that that um, journey of the accessibility thank you very much <laughs> you. and if you have some more questions please I've got one. So I, I was curious, just kind of taking off of the, the point you made with the Royal Ontario and these uh, tactile experiences being relevant for everyone or, or maybe being the default experience. Uh, I definitely felt like seeing the art examples even in the beginning where maybe some of the visual art is broken down, sort of the way that you're showing the composition for someone like myself that I find I'm not always that visual, I would probably gravitate towards seeing an experience like that. And I was curious if museums you've worked with have, you know, if they do observations or see the, who, who are using these experiences or do they collect any data yeah, about that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I can say for myself because I had the chance to see for two years and a half visitors in my museum using uh, the tactile device as, as for their own. Mm -hmm. Uh, and making that connection uh, with the, those devices. Uh, but of course, it can help, uh, for instance, to have a big character, big fonts, help the seniors, mm -hmm. help the children who start to read, help someone who just start to learn the language. Um, it's, as the sa it's the same mindset that where we were seeking about, where, what we were saying about uh, wheelchair. When I think about the, chair, the space for a wheelchair, I also help someone with a trolley, someone who just broke his leg, um, someone who have a group of people who are going in. So it's really the same mindset to say to think that we can this, we can serve much more than one visitors. Absolutely.
Um, I was curious. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I was curious when you spoke earlier about partnering with museums and um, being able to have partnership and collaboration in terms of being able to create these layouts. I'm curious um, for any of the the, the ex exhibition designers, do you find any pushback um, from their creative perspective in terms of whatever creative vision that they have for experiencing those materials versus making them accessible? Or do you find that it's um, that's an easy process in terms of getting them to cooperate? That's really depend of the institution, definitely. For instance, with the Royal Ontario Museum, they really have deeply committed uh, designer we are, we are in relation with them. They know how to design tactile. They really want to learn more and to go further. So we have very good experience with like that. In other institutions, it's much more like concrete to move. And um, that's why I say that it's always good to have some experts. Uh, like uh, the users, but also like company, like Tactile Studio, to just help the one in the museum who believe in that, but who cannot convince all his colleagues because he's working every day with them and he's just the one who, are ah, you going to come and just speak about your disabled people and blah, blah, blah. And no, we really see that people who are committed, uh, that can be the accessibility manager, that can be someone in the education, that can be someone in the exhibition who believe in that. But as I told before, there is so many constraints. There is a timeline. There, there are budgets. There are so many problems that accessibility often is like the last wagon of the train. But when you just put it in the first uh, place, you see the very, um, very big difference into the team, into the final exhibition, into the visitor's experience. So it's really, if there is some, just one thing to remember of that is that the accessibility is good for everyone. And it's going, doing that, it's not easy, but it's helping everyone from the museum, but also from the experience visitors, visitor experience, absolutely. Um, since art is often subjective, how do you, or what's your process in terms of determining how to interpret for the, the stations, like how you, like what you're actually choosing to convey? Yeah, we, we speak uh, about that a bit earlier, that we design, we selected the part to represent or to highlight depending on the intention of the exhibition. Uh, if, for instance, it's, it's for an exhibition, a uh, temporary exhibition about um, some, about the portrait and the symbol of power, we're going to show different, we're not going to select the same kind of portrait with the same kind of symbols, of course we're going to select different, uh, different one who give different information for people. There is another thing that we have to keep in mind that is um, for someone who go in a museum, he wants to see diversity, doesn't want to enter in the same room again and again and see with the same type of uh, hanging, the same text and everything. We want diversity. So it's also in the tactile pass, it's also um, something. So maybe sometimes you can put a, a 3D model. Sometimes it's a low relief. Sometimes it's just graphic interpretation. It can be sound. It, ca it can be smell. So just mixing all the senses uh, help people. And Enzon also really, uh, really works. Thank you. You're welcome. I think there is one there. Okay, and we'll have time for one more question after this. Hi, hi, Raleigh. Thank you so much for this presentation. I was just wondering, can you speak a little bit more about the research part, how you Im involve um, people with different disability into your research to kind of come up with this design? Yeah, we build partnership with association. So depending on the project uh, with the museum, um, they're mostly museum who hire hers. Sometimes it's a, a fabricant or a scenographic team. Um, and we, into the scuttle, integrate some prototypes and moments to share with, um, with the community. So depending on the region in Germany, it's going to be some, it's more relevant to do it with the, the um, local uh, 
community because those people are going to speak about uh, to the others about your project and they're going to go and discover your project with their friend. So um, it's always trying and people are always very uh, happy to share and to go into those kind of projects. So it's uh, usually a little group of people, like four or five people uh, from, a, um, from a community. Yeah. Anyone have a last question? No. Or maybe we timed it perfectly. Yeah. Oh, we, got one. Uh, we got one last question. Just, just to tell you, if you want, after that, of course, I, I am avail available for any question. Um, you have an experience, an audio experience of uh, Van Gogh. Uh, there is a, a cask and uh, a button you can press to discover a tactile interpretation of a Van Gogh with, um, with the special touch of this artist. Uh, there is some sample and cards, so just please feel free to come and see me or to let your card if you want to have more information. I will be pleased to send it to you. Uh. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, it's really interesting because, I mean, in the U.S., I, I'm not sure, are there standards for museums right now in terms of accessibility? Um, I was just curious if you've, you know, if you've encountered any uh, challenges here in the U.S. If um, there are, uh, sorry, um, can you repeat your question? Are there standards for accessibility um, in museums in the U.S.? Yeah. There are um, a lot of, even in New York, there are a lot of challenges for, for people with disabilities. So I'm, I'm just curious if you've... Yes, absolutely. There are some standards. The Smithsonian Museum made uh, wrote some standards. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual is it's uh, um, they, they did it a few years ago, but they uh, they did a recently um, um, new ad inside. Uh, so definitely, yes, there there is, and uh, and in North America, museum, mostly science museum, are really committed into that uh, topic because. From originally, science centers are more into the experience of explaining science. Doing it's uh, more easy to uh, to understand. To it's better to uh, memorize. So, so they do a lot. I also have guidelines. If you want, I can send it to you. Um, and so, the 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 bridge is also to go until fine art museum, to go until design museum, to um, make that being normal and common to have those kind of, uh, of solution. Mm. All right, well, thank uh, you so much. Thank again. you, <laughs> thank you very much. So just uh, in closing, uh, thank you everyone again for coming to Accessibility New York City. We're gonna be having two events actually in the month of June. So um, check out the, the meetup page. We, we actually have two people again coming in from uh, out of New York City that are they're interested in presenting to the group. Uh, so very excited about that. Want to again thank our event host here, ThoughtBot, as a sponsor uh, for the meetup. We also want to thank Level Access, um, who sponsors our captioning, and as well as Adobe, who's also one of the sponsor sponsors of the uh, accessibility events there. Um, in final, kind of in a uh, my announcement uh, for Global Accessibility Awareness Day, I'm actually moving away from New York City. I'm moving to Japan, so glo global awareness. Uh, I'm excited to work on accessibility kind of in that space. I'll still be very involved remotely. Stacy Smith, who's here and has been at, you know, most of the last meetups over the years, she's gonna be, you know, representing equal entry um, at these events. And it's been great getting to work with the community here and. Look forward to seeing what continues to develop. And again, uh, thank you to Jolly McPhee from Internet Society of New York for um, producing our streams and for white coat captioning for the excellent captions that were provided tonight. And uh, excited to try out some of these hands-on uh, examples over here. So uh, we'll ad adjourn now, and we should look to be out of here by 9 PM tonight. Thanks, everyone.